dresses in silver Acid tongue and the walls are bleeding She needs a vacation from the horses Hey everyone, it's Manny. I'm here with Produce Like a Pro, Warren Heward. I'm doing a mixed breakdown of a song called Birds of Paradise for a band called Spirit in the Room. Uh, the intro is the actual video for the song. This song came out over the summer and was one of their singles. And we're basically sh showcasing how this song came about. So um, I think it's important that, at least for Produce Like a Pro and some of this stuff, that you actually have tracks that are really going out. It was a band. It wasn't necessarily generated to make this video. This was actually the real deal, you know, blood, sweat, and tears mix in a band really trying to achieve greatness, at least the best they can, through my studio, Suplex Audio. So we started this record during the pandemic, which most of us know it was an epic time for all musicians. They're very lucky during that time to have gotten signed to Housecore Records, which is Phil from Pantera's label out of Louisiana. So given that, I had just barely moved in the suplex. So you're going to hear this very raw, really exciting sound. This particular song reminded me of a Peter Gabriel song called Intruder. When you hear this and the way I processed the drums, I wanted that feeling. As we built this song, there's a lot of cool things that I enjoyed doing. This one in particular, I wanted to do the Ringo Starr drums. So what it consists of in the miking was one overhead, and then you only mic the bottom of the snare, the bottom of the rack tom, and the bottom of the floor tom. And when you do that, you always flip the bottom heads, usually out of phase. And so they're in phase with the top mic. Now you have the biggest floor tom ever, a rack tom, you know, because you have the bottom mic picking up. And then as you strike the tom, this mic above your head is picking up the tom. Let's start with the drums. And this is Philip Bailey, the drummer. And uh, he played to a click. And when what came back in his headphones were the original demo of the song. That means the vocals, some of the synths that are still here, and kind of the basic foundation of the song. So I'm going to play the drums. And then I'm going to pull some of the plugins off so you can hear what it really sounded like. So there's no like fancy pants mixing here or like, oh my God, I'm so good. You know, like da 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 da. I'm just like, you know what? Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> drums are hard. So here's the basic drums. And then I'll pull some of the plugins off so you can hear what they really sounded like. All right, you can tell there's some grit, there's some distortion. This is all intentional. One other disclaimer, and I know people have always commented, like, what is up with my meters just being ripping in the red? When I tracked all these drums, nothing was in the red, or all the guitars, or all the bass. Everything is just flatlined, not in the red. Um, I have an older Pro, Pro Tools rig, and even guys like Joe Brisi and other big producers for a long time in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, have relied on those older systems that used to cost about forty to fifty thousand dollars. I actually bought one of those older systems when they had fallen out of grace. So I have like a, it's mine stops at Pro Tools ten. I have one ninety two uh, interfaces, which I, I got to say they're amazing. I'm not saying this is analog, but I feel like because I use a lot of waves and some older plugins that may not be the hippest or modern. And you have to be very careful on your modern DAW systems that you don't put things in the red. I feel like because of my system, my speakers, my ATCs, what I'm running through, I'm pushing the envelope of how much distortion and harmonics and even digital distortion is coming through my mix. 
So that being said, when you get these files, definitely tame them down into what sounds good on your DAW. And I know that's not exactly what I have here, but I'm giving you the fundamentals. But just remember, when you look at my screen and you see the drums are just screaming in the red, that is just something I have a little bit more forgiveness, I believe, in this system. I don't know the theory of that. I, no one's ever told me. But I can definitely push my Pro Tools system a lot farther with this older rig. So, fair warned. So the drums, as you heard them, Typical drum set, I mean, there's nothing really that special about it except it sounds killer to me. Uh, what I did on the kick drum is I added a sub kick. And what I did is I routed my actual kick drum sound to an auxiliary. On this auxiliary, I boosted all the low end and cut all the high end. Then I put it into an EQ, but I didn't engage it. So my kick drum is now being auxiliaried into this auxiliary that I just showed you with the EQ and the kick drum. And the reason I have that kick drum is because I'm checking phase in or out. After I ran that auxiliary, I ran it into another auxiliary with another plug-in with low end on it. Same way I cut all the highs, a little bit different than that one. Then the out of that one runs back into the first one which then gives you a feedback. I know this is weird to say it, but there's an old trick. You can look up some Steve Albini tricks, and I actually did one here with Warren on the kick drum sounds. So I actually literally not only showed the trick, I actually use it. And all I'm really doing is I'm adding a kick drum because I'm boosting, I'm just cranking it. And I'm adding this kind of, if you can imagine an earthquake shaking, <laughs> but it's still in the realm of like analog tape. I'm going to play the kick drum just by itself. And what you're going to hear is the sub. But it's not a sub. It's an EQ with only a low one that I felt was musical. So it's to taste when you do this. Okay. Now that's just, yeah, it sounds like. A dirt box distortion on a kick drum. That's exactly what I'm doing. So now I'll add in the kick drum, the original sound with that. So now I have a blend of both. So I've got my original kick drum and now I've got the subs in with it. Most kick drums you add high end, you want snap to it. This is really like dull, big, sonically heavy drums. So now I'll put it in, I'll put in all the drums now, and I'm gonna break down what I have. So that's so on this kick drum, I had put a little bit of a reverb. And I know sometimes that's considered illegal, but I learned when I did some hunt sale stuff and even Mario C from the Beast Boys and a lot of people, you can get really crafty things with reverbs. This one is a PSP 2445. I love this one. It's such a killer. It's an EMT plate. Um, so I put a little bit of that on the kick drum. I'll let you hear that with it or without. Turn it up. You can hear it. So I almost put it down to where, where it's just blurring the drums a little bit, but it's adding a little bit of space around the kick drum. Then I have an EQ, which is one of my favorites. It's a 560 EQ. What I love about it is I'm still taking off some of the highs on that. I'm boosting 2K. A little bit of that snap of the kick drum. Not doing too much in the low end because I've already ran it to that other sound source. And, which is really cool, is lo-fi. And if you just put this plugin on the track, it just does a little distortion to it. So I'll play you with it and without it. Now, why would you want to put distortion on that? I come from the analog world, so my ears always want to kind of F up the sound a little bit. So if you're really a clean deal and everything's got to be clean and like, you know, spotless audio, this may not be your kind of thing. But I feel like when I do stuff like this, it's a little bit appropriate to the bands. This band is crusty, grindy, 
there's digital, there's analog, there's real instruments, there's synths. You got to add a little bit of spark to some of the audio. So even though we're just talking about the kick drum, the lo-fi plug-in is amazing. And actually, it's funny, the last maybe two or three records, I kind of forgot about that. So uh, doing this with you made me go, oh, yeah, we better uh, pull up that lo-fi uh, plug-in. Okay, so now we've done the kick drum. I don't really have anything on this. There's zero. There's nothing on the snares. And like I said, those are being bussed over to an auxiliary, which I'll show you that. But what's interesting about this drum set is because of that technique of me doing the bottoms and the tops, when I, re when I recorded them, I did not do anything to the process. We just listened to them, and they were just huge. But now that we've mixed the song, the toms, when he struck them, do 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 ba. They were like, doing, da, boom, boom. There's a long decay of, it's a real tom, it's not a sample. So one of my favorite things is to gate something that's kind of out of control on the drums. And I did gate the toms. He had two floors and one rack tom. So now I'll play you it. I'm going to ungate the toms. And now I'm going to play the drum track kind of really as it was when we did it. And I'll show you what I did to kind of put more control in the drums. You hear all the toms just ringing, which is what a real drum set sounds like. So now I've gated them, and now I've added control. So it's like everyone has its own space, and they die out before going to too much decay, especially in the kick drum. And the tom just sounds like you just... Your ears are right on the tom, and that's not what we really wanted. Here it is. Get it. Gates off. It's on. So that's some extracurricular stuff I did on the drums. Nothing too fancy, but as you can tell, now there's a little bit more control and definition on the gating. The room mics on this, I did automate them towards the end of the song, and I have them coming in and out, and I also put a time delay on them, which I love to do. I don't have a big drum room. And this is a tip for you if you don't got a big, you know, people put mics, I, I put mics on the ceiling sometimes in the corners. But when I recorded with Steve Albini, and he was the one kind of showed me how to record, I didn't really understand the theory of this when we did it, except, oh my God, you put mics on the floor. That's cool. Just don't step on them. <laughs> and um, now I find myself always putting mics on the floor because I actually use them in, benef in the benefits of not having a big room. So my room in there is not that large. I think they're like 11 foot, 12 foot ceilings, which is considerably large, but the room isn't big. And what I do is I put on a plywood, probably uh, two feet by four feet down. And I, I have Alta Coke bottles, but I think you can use anything, even Octavas, Omnis. Anything Omni that's a, um, a condenser or a tube worked better than a dynamic. And I, even in recent, I've been using the uh, Mojave MA37, which is one of my favorite mics. I would put them on the floor on the plywood. So you have the drums playing, and because I have carpet, my room's technically a rehearsal room, the hardwood is giving me a little bit of slapback of that, of that um, Omni. And then I put a time delay on it. And this one, in Pro Tools, it doesn't show me how many milliseconds, but I'm assuming somewhere between, and it's to, to taste, somewhere between... 8 to 15, you can go 20 or 25, but you have to be sweeter with the blend. So I'll bring in the rooms, and I'll take them out and let you hear them uh, with and without that little bit of the decay. And I also have, once again, I literally just put the plug-in lo-fi on it. I don't even touch it. I don't even adjust anything on it. It just instantly comes out a little bit distorted, which that's what I did on the room mics. So here it is without the room mics. So 
now I'll take out the plugins. Bring them back in. One thing I hope you'll pick up on kind of what I do here is I mix crazy. I know that. I know there's going to be a lot of always mention some illegal things going on here, which most of the time you would say don't do that. But I record 100% original cool bands that I work in LA. I'm not a YouTube guy. I just work. I've been working nonstop for a lot of years. In doing that, I like to be creative. And no one tells me what to do or not to do. So the lo-fi, distorting the room mics, and you can hear them when they come in. They're cool, you know? Out. It's kind of like living safe and living dangerous. <laughs> so I'm going to say I'm going to live dangerous like that. I really love what that does. And that, once again, is that ear candy thing that's not that much going on. You're not really doing anything crazy. I'm not getting in there you know, doing crazy stuff to the files. I'm literally putting a slight distortion, which you could even say putting like a four track on it. Then I'm delaying it, which is pushing the audio back to give the room more depth. And that is the secret to small rooms. And no one has ever told me and heard that and goes, oh, it sounds like a small rehearsal room. Well, guess what? It is a small rehearsal room, but just know that you can really be creative and learn your space and what you can push the boundaries. Sometimes a mic in the corner, delaying those a few milliseconds could make your drum room sound absolutely epic. All right, so now we're moving into the auxiliary that is capturing all those drums. So I got the gates on the toms. I got that really gnarly kind of sub kick that's messing up the distortion, but it's cool. Then I have these room mics that I slightly distorted that when you put on headphones, you can hear them kind of like a it's kind of like a fight going on with the drums on the left and right side. A good fight. Since I did some automation on the more on the end of the song, when he starts to rock out, I wanted the drums to open up a bit. So the drums do open up at the end of the song. But on my master bus, I needed to do a lot of taming of the sounds. So I'm going to turn all the plugins off. And you're going to hear the drums come through the bus. And then I'll start to bring in each plug in. And then I'll explain a little bit what's going on here. Kind of low. That's the API. Now I have that cranked, but it's to taste on what you feel like they should be going. I'm pushing them for sure. It's one of my favorites. So as you can tell, I put a Fairchild on this. Thinking Beatles, kind of gluey messy it's barely working barely on and that's the best way to use those don't slam them you could if i put vocals in them sometimes you could see them you know kind of move up with the vocal every time it comes in it's like up and then compressing it these drums i just wanted something gluey and deep so then i put a pull tech one of my favorite jack joseph Quaig. Just a standard comes with it. I'm not really doing that much to it. I'm boosting, God, uh, maybe 4K. And the attenuator is really cool because you can make it sound, I can take all the low end out. So I bring it back in. Sounded good. Without it, it's okay. In. I notice when I use this uh, pull tag is that it makes the snare sound really cool and has a little bit of that little bit of that tap to the to the kick drum. So then another legal thing, I have a delay in there. It's barely on.
This is an ace delay, which I think is a common one. Everybody has it. Or you can probably use any kind of tape delay. Since I'm so familiar with echoplexes, I kind of use it in that place. Now, it has an analog, which is kind of a white noise thing. I just turn that off. I probably have it up 5%, maybe. And you can hear it without it and with it. So this is with it on. So here I am moving in small increments. And this is that whole thing of why this was an epic mix, because there was no shortcuts. We really worked on this until, I mean, mostly the band wasn't here when I was doing all these things, but I was basically trying to build something to make the drums have a lot of character. So that was that. And then I put a de -esser. So I have it around 7K cutting. Now you see a lot come down. Now this is, once again, to taste. I don't always put a de on it, but when I do, it's a killer drummer. Now, uh, when I don't like to do sometimes, it really can, it's really dangerous to use. And you have to be very careful of what you're using this for to cut. I, once again, because this is, I have no one looking over my shoulder to tell me, hey Manny, that's actually completely wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna use that because at, when I put up all the tracks and I have these vicious guitars and synths, I felt like the drums, some of the upper frequencies were, were, were becoming, sounding a little bit harsher. So I always look at a de almost like being like tape. I mean, it really, people use EQs, de are somewhat like an EQ, you can pick a frequency and bring that down. But I, what I love about de is it does it naturally. If I got an EQ and just, totally just dropped out that frequency. I feel like it doesn't sound organic. It doesn't sound moving. And because I'm used to analog tape, I love the fact that tape would be a moving, giving, feeling thing. So when I use de a lot of times it's used to just bring back that feeling of what it sounded like when things were running through tape. So that's it. Now I have it delayed a bit because I'm also sensitive to groove. And if I felt like, even though he's playing to a click, I wanted to move him back a little bit just I don't know, it's like giving the guy a joint. Whether he played on the click, off the click, I felt like he sounded better with, like I said, an audio joint, which is just slipping him back a few milliseconds. I mean, I have it barely on. It isn't really good to play with it or without. It's not really doing anything except slightly sipping his drums back, but I didn't want to do it with the files. I just did it with a plugin, and this is just a standard Pro Tools plugin that comes in. It said 204 samples. I don't know what that would be. I guess I can get out, calculate, and figure it out. But for the most part, it's to taste. So now the drums, everything in it. Oh, shoot. There is a sub in there. There's an 808. Forgot about that. All right, so he has... If you can look at the screen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is something that I didn't do, but Dennis, when he was writing his demo, he had these moments that he felt in the songwriting and putting it together, he wanted some 808s in there. So we added them in. Awesome. I just put a Wave LA-2A on it, not even doing that much. That is doing much. <laughs> So once again, to taste, and then I put a, oh, actually, you know, I'm putting a cut on it, if you can imagine that. And take it out. A hair, I'm just removing some of that sonic thump of the 808. Then he had a shaker. All right, just filling in the blanks there. Once again, to taste, De Dennis, he's a great artist. And, you know, if you're a producer and you're working with someone, you definitely want to, don't want to declaw that person. Just let him put everything he wants in there. And it's kind of like then when you start to mix it, you'll always make decisions that are great. Uh, I don't do too much. In the old days, I was a little bit more of controlling of what came in. But now I'm just like, bring it all in. And then a lot of time there's pleasant surprises and pleasant accidents that happen. So 
I'm not being brutal on that. I didn't look at that against the click and go, is it on, is it off? When you put it in, it definitely adds something really cool. Hey everyone, it's Manny here. I'm with my dearest friend, Dennis. Dennis is in the spirit in the room. Yeah, spirit in the room. It's basically just a vehicle for all the minimal weird sounds and frequencies I have in my head. And that's kind of how the song was born. Born on the, uh, there was a subwoofer patch I don't know, a little fatty Moog that I use quite a bit. Yeah, I just hit that sub over and over and looped it and then started singing over it. Well, here's another one. How did you record it? What did you record it on? A duet, garage band. Nice. And an SM57. I love it. Into a Moger Fuger delay that went into the little fatty. And I, I might have did it through an amp. I don't know if I went straight into the laptop with it. I mean, that's a cool thing. If you're if you're a producer or an engineer, or even if you're in a band, people have this sense of like what is professional and where you're supposed to make your records. And I think that pride aside, like for me to to get everything he did and say no, we have to do it again in a studio, I think misses the point about capturing lightning in a bottle. And yeah. the fact that now people have GarageBand on the computers. Uh, Ableton, whatever DAW format they're recording on, it was way more important for Dennis to come home, hit his computer, and record something, and it almost didn't matter what he was recording it on. Yeah, totally. So, so when I got the file, he just gave me all these files, and then we kind of created the song. So tell us what's the song about, and actually the name of the song that we're going to be doing. The song is called The Bird of Paradise Alights Only Upon the Hand That Does Not Grasp. And what's the EP called? The EP is called Flamingo. The song about is about some the situations I, I kind of found myself in during the pandemic. But getting back to what you were saying about the the, the easiness and the access of the, the technology, just like that, I can't I I can't have too many knobs, mm -hmm. you know, or else I lose <laughs> the idea. I wouldn't if I would have had to have gone through all compressors and all this other stuff, mm -hmm. then I then I wouldn't have had. The melody you know or i wouldn't have done it it's just been like okay i got this really cool sub frequency let me compress it or let me figure out you know how to it's super minimal and super super easy setup and that way i'm able to just focus on the idea you know but the the song itself totally came out of the the, the little fatty the little moog little fatty when you put all your stuff onto um garage band when you started to lay down this song describe to me how it went in layers like what did you start with first and then, I can't remember the point that when you came in here with the song, but what, what was done in that time, or what elements did you lay down before I got it and we added stuff on it? I, yeah, it's just all started from the sub at the beginning, the little fatty sub, little fatty vocals, and then the beat, kind of the, I, I, uh, I have this MIDI controller, same shitty MIDI controller I've used forever, and I just made the beat on there with my hand. And those garage band drums? With those garage band drums, man, with that metronome popping. Nice. We, I rolled with it from there, and, and the bass and, and all that shit kind of came after, but it was it's all from the little fatty. And what about the synth sounds, the little weird noises? There's some really strange stuff that goes on. In yeah, there's a lot of that little fatty, man. I can't say enough about it. And I, I just tweaked the hell out of that thing and used so many. I don't remember the names of the patches on there, but mm. if you have one, you could, you could probably find. There's a hundred patches on there. You'll find it. There's a lot of stuff that you and I had done with the uh, Casio. The Casio. Yeah. Oh yeah, the snare. Yeah, <laughs> Steffi had given me that <laughs> weird uh, pedal, and we just made it sound like a hammer hitting a mallet yeah. or something like that. And I think this song came from an elemental thing, like a, an, an, a pulse and an air. It, to it and yeah it wasn't really it wasn't it's obviously not a guitar song it wasn't written on a guitar it yeah totally i totally give credit to that little fatty and you and you lyrically like i said some dark hallways i found myself turning into during the pandemic yeah as you know being pandemic was being scary for everyone it, yes and you heard all about it during mm -hmm. it and so yeah i'm just grateful it's out and people can hear it and the response has been good and I'm glad we made it through it. Well, well, one cool thing I'll just say is that if you don't know the back history of how even Dennis is sitting here with me, is that his band used to play locally in Los Angeles and I'd always hear about them. I just kind of wrote them and said, hey man, I really like your band and would you come down and maybe we can chat about making a record. So organically, I just met Dennis. There's no, he didn't, I mean, he may have heard some music. I think I, 
Philip, his drummer, came from. Oh yeah, right. Well, we didn't know that. We didn't know that yet, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the cool thing was that after I talked to Dennis, I had no idea. There's some records I did when I first started. There was a band called Vaz, and it's called Dying to Meet You. There were ex Hammerhead guys that were off of Amphetamine Reptile. Um, The Vaz record was on a, a label called GSL. And I didn't even know it at the time that he, that was one of his favorite records. So as we were talking about working together, we came to find out that he was a really fan of some bands that I'd worked with. So there was a mutual like respect and love of some of the stuff we've done. And then I was really super excited because I'd saw them more live footage and being like, wow, I would love to know how do you capture that in a recording studio. So when we decided to make this record at the beginning of the pandemic, that in itself was crazy and how the world was. So here we are today. I mean, things have gotten a lot better, hopefully for everybody out there. My main thing for this is to show people that you can be creative in your house. You don't need a big producer to do some of the stuff that we're doing. And as an artist, you are empowered with the way Dennis made his record with GarageBand or whatever format he would have used to make cool music. And the fact that I could join him in this and kind of like he trusted me to do the things that I've learned about making records. When you wrote the song, now you did bass on it too. How did you record the bass into your DAW or what did you do for that process of the bass and any guitars? I just did uh, SM57 and an SM7 for vocals. SM57 into an Apogee duet mm. into the laptop. I used this, you can't really see it, but there's this uh, I love that amp. micro Ampeg amp that's which i've used Mm -hmm. for everything for the longest time man and like i said the the least amount of shit in my in my way the better you don't have to be technical to be creative and you don't have to be rich the way technology is now you anybody can just get their ideas out man i I remember being a kid and having two tape recorders and Mm -hmm. and I, i would hit record on one and I had a trash can laid in the floor it was my kick drum and the, the lid was my snare and I'd track, a, <laughs> I'd track the drums into the one the same tape thing. recorder yeah. and then push play on that while that's playing and hit record on the other one and then play the riff over the same nice. thing. It's like, you, if you got it in you, there's, you can do things so much better now than back then with two tape recorders, even though those were pretty badass sounds. I, I wish those. I could find those, man. But. And you did put a 57 on your little lamp, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A music man. I've used the same. I've used the same gear for t- 10, 12 years. I, I find something I like and I stick with it. You know, like Kevin, our guitar player, yourself included. Yeah. You guys, you guys like to dig deep and, and get. Into but I mean, your that's toes. like that's like Eddie Van Halen era. That's like is that seventies or eighties? Yeah, music that's, man. that's seventy. I mean, when you were younger, I live in Los Angeles, but in our world, the San Gabriel Valley, those music men were like something that you would find at. Pedrini's music or somewhere in Pasadena doctor music where Eddie Van Halen would buy his stuff and and I do admit when I when he would send me his guitar tracks and I would upload them they were fierce they sounded great you know so then we did bass guitars now on the bass guitars there is a bass on the right and there's a bass on the left Now, those are vicious. Um, Once again, I've, my favorite, lo-fi. Just, if you can imagine, I know it's distorted, and you're like, why did you put that on it? Well, we'll see. Here's, uh, I'm going to turn off all the plugins, and I'll add the lo-fi. So the before and after is obvious, and I'm obviously using an LA-2A, which I, it's just the standard waves. I love it. And, you know, people have all these fans. I mean, I'm really using my plugins like a toolbox. No favorites, just using things that I need to make things louder or compress. And at the end of the day, I just want it to sound really musical. So here's both basses going with the plugins, and then I'll turn them off and turn them on to let you hear that.
Now, to be clear, when we're talking about that metering thing, obviously my meters are blasting. But sonically, it sounds really good to me. And like I said, they did not come in my DAW blasting. And if I play back the audio, what you see on my Pro Tools, it's not even in the red or anywhere near it. So you can tell I've raised them up a lot in volume. And I think that's one of the secrets when you talk about mixing of guys that are like, I'm not saying that I'm the pro dude, but there's a lot of guys that mix. And you hear your roughs, and you're like, wow, why can't I, what are they doing that makes it, and a lot of it is just really stepping up the audio. And like, because of my ATCs, uh, my monitoring system, I have an inward, inward connections right here that I'm really, can select speakers, I can hear in mono. When I do the playback on this, sounds incredible. So as I'm pushing the envelope of those plugins, that is where I think you can win or lose. So if you spend all this money on these plugins or a DAW or whatever you're spending your money on, the last thing people always think about is, is, is the speakers and what you're listening to. It's kind of like buying a Porsche and then you put some cheap tires on it and you, you can't even stay on the road. <laughs> so it's like getting some good tires for your car, you know? Yeah, they cost 500 bucks a piece and you're spending 2,000 bucks to put these tires on, but your Porsche's got to stay on the highway. Same with the speakers. Your mixes have to stay on the highway of what you're doing. If you don't know what you're listening to, you're just going to be guessing all the time. And I've done my best to put a system together where there's no more guessing. And, and now I'm only working on, does this song sound cool and exciting as opposed to, is there really enough flowing in this or da da da, you know? All right, so there's a whole bass thing going on. He's got a lot going on here in the low end department. Now that is a DI, and all I want to, because they have the basses left and right, those are hardcore, just grinding. Uh, I wanted some center low end, so I made a DI, and he's got a few plugins on it, so let me turn them off, and you're gonna hear raw dog bass. So, a really good trick. I put an EQ on that because I don't want that. I already got distorted bass on the left or right. And I just took off all the upper frequencies. Now this is a killer trick. If you're doing a lot of tracks and you got the guys putting down a banjo, a guitar, an acoustic, a synth, a cello, anything, Without getting, once again, fancy, you can just put up a simple EQ. And now I'm just putting what I want to happen. So I wanted this low end in the center, but I got only these distorted basses. And that was me basically making a, a kind of subsonic low end that fits the middle of the speaker. So then there's an R bass. It tamed it more, but so it's very subliminal. But that's gonna work good with, once I put them all in, a little of a distortion, sans amp. I'm bringing it back up now. Now I put a vocal rider. A vocal rider is a great tool. And it's basically lets me control how loud it's gonna never go past what I know you can use a limiter or something, but I just love the vocal rider because I can just throw it on a track, you set it and you forget it. And if I want it louder during the song, I can raise up the output, I can uh, raise up the actual rider of how much I'm clamping down. So I wanted that bass never to jump out. I just want it to be rock solid. I actually have it cranked. Now I'm gonna play it with the uh, left and right basses. And now I'm gonna take out the, the center.
Now you can hear that's a rowdy party going on. That's probably why I use a little bit of the de-esser. When it gets raunchy, it's not that round, raunchy, and I want it to be very cool with that. So once again, now you get the understanding of what I'm... Now, I don't know too many people that would pan a bass left and right, but I loved it. It worked out really great in the song, and he happens to play that way. So, you know, once again, just it's a preference. So one of the other things he has in this arsenal of bass sounds, I have an eight string. So there's four strings on a bass. This one comes with four more. And you basically have like a low E uh, bass and a low E guitar. And if you don't know what that sounds like, um, Jimi Hendrix wrote a lot of his records with that eight string, like Manic Depression, I think had a little bit of that. And he would always be playing the eight string hag, Cheap Trick, notoriously famous for an eight string, and even Pearl Jam, doom, doo, 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 boom, boom. Jeremy, that may have been a 12 string. Aerosmith, um, whew, I mean, John Paul Jones, Jesus. If, if you listen to John Paul Jones' solo record, that may be an, uh, a 12 string bass. So, and even Lemmy from Motorhead played him. So I have that in my arsenal, and we did Hackstrom. And this is the Hackstrom bass. Now I'm gonna add in the DI. Now with all that going on, why do you need another one in there? To me, it reminds me of like a saxophone. It's not too low, it's not too high, and it's got a little bit of girth. So I have these massively distorted basses. I've got now this thumping low end kind of just sinister middle bass. And now I've added a, an eight string bass to reinforce that. Now, can you really hear that in the mix? I don't know. But when you put all these pieces together, it starts to get your mix to sound really interesting. And that is always the final thing. I think you should make your mixes to always sound interesting. You should always put the, the best things forward. And there is no, nor I mean, you listen to Foo Fighter records and they're like, you know, the greatest sonic mixes. They play them on the radio. Is everything in there that I would do in mixing? Probably not. But whatever the Foo Fighters do, that is perfect for you. And you have to always remember that when you're mixing, it should uh, complement the band. And those styles of mixes sound amazing, as opposed to even like Rich Costi with The Muse. I mean, I love those too. And they, Dave Sardi, Steve Albini, you know, you can go down the, a plethora of producers, how they've made some of their best records sound cool. I think a lot of it is getting the most interesting things and making it sound rad. So that's covering pretty much all the bass things. I have one more little sound here. So that's in with everything. It's crazy. A really cool trick you can do, I call this the um, wall of sound. And if you're not familiar with it, some, some of the Beatles records, since you were kind of limited to, you didn't really have a, a, a track in those old days of just having it for a percussion or something, just, just that alone. There's always an accumulation of a bunch of stuff together. A lot of times when the German would be playing and they want a wall of sound, they would have a, a piano and a tambourine and a cello or a guitar. There's something sonically generating a tone and you put that under the snare. It sounds so cool. And there could be so many different ways of doing it. I've done it with piano, real piano, acoustic guitar, uh, a boatload of guitar effects. We happen to use a little, um, I think we used a, a Moog, and then I had a little Casio. These are the sounds that were established with the drum beat. So I'll play the drums, and then I'll add in the wall of sound, uh, the extracurricular tracks we added. And I'll go through those and break down what they are. So here they are.
Now, to me, that's super cool, and that's definitely something I don't really hear people doing too much. And I think if you can figure out in your studio things that can do this harmonic, and you have to choose it, you know, proper. So I have a low one, a middle one, and then a high one. And each one of those kind of has something really cool about them. They're all running into, once again, an LA 2A. So I'm not, you know, once again, I'm just using simple things to get the result I wanted. They're not a fancy plugin. There's nothing crazy about these plugins. I use more cuts than anything else. So I use my, I really like this one. I just basically dial out all the low end. So I'll let you hear that one uh, with some of the low end kind of dialed out. Barely. Hear that? Once again, that is why I love a simple EQ. And if you can tell, I'm just that you heard that thud. Sometimes when you get sounds, if you have that little thud in the rest of your mix and the drums and everything's percussive, it really takes away from it. So you have to be creative. It takes a little bit of time to do this. But after a while, you'll just like, oh, we're putting up a piano. Boom, you put up your, you know, I think there's a seven band EQ. And you just kind of move through it. So if you can tell. Excellent. I mean, that's just so cool. And it's something so simple you can do in all the time. So, you know, you don't, once again, you don't need something fancy, but you have to use your ears. You have to have a great monitoring system to know what you're actually cutting. So we have these big drums, big bass. I don't want big synths, especially when it's doing the wall of sound thing. So once again, I'll put them all together. All right, so now here comes another synth of his. This is an important part of the song because it starts off with it. I did it a little bit on this one as well, as you can tell, but not too much. He wanted the girth of that, but we didn't want the upper frequencies. So once again, use your ears to taste. I'm using the EQ basically to kind of give other things room to fit in there. So that one's called labeled as a little fatty. So now that has to be sonically feeling great around those angry basses and the wall of sound. So we'll add those together. Now we're building the track. It's, I mean, we've got so much stuff. I mean, this is like a lot of stuff. We haven't even gotten into the guitars and the Leslies and the, probably 20 vocals, but that's the fun. If you're doing this for real and you're trying to make a record, you have to bring all these elements in and then figure out how to then s spit them out in a left and right imagery that sounds pleasant. And all these little tricks I'm showing you with compressions and EQs, it's not really anything crazy. It's just about using your ears. And then the sound sources, when you mic them up and when you do them, make sure that as you bring them into your session, 
they sound really cool. Now, I'm only speaking of someone that has recorded the content, and now I'm mixing it. Guys that just only do mixing, there's another skill set in there, but I'm actually able to dictate what comes in and then what comes out, and that's why this is working for me here on this song, and you'll have to you know, use your best ears if you're just mixing something, or when you get these tracks, go to town, have fun with all these synths, really do some cool stuff with them, maybe reverbs, maybe not distorting some of the bass, maybe not even using the distorted bass, just more synth-oriented and make a synth version of the song. So it's, it could be really fun. So here's some other synths that we had in here. Now this one's listed as a Moog, and I have a feeling it's going to be Moogie. This one I added the low again. I just literally put the plug-in on it. There's the EQ again that I was showing you. I really wanted that to fit Sonic. I mean, there's so much crazy stuff going on. I'm just picking my battles of what's going to be cutting through the left or right. I'm cutting it like, I guess at 40, I just did a, a cut rate at 40. And um, maybe around 2K, it just starts to dive off. And I don't want anything above that. So now that's that in. Once again, this is another section complementing all this madness that we've already done. Same thing, just an LA-2A, I'm pretty sure I did that EQ, yeah. So on this one, you can tell that like the other ones, I'm kind of not, I'm just not copying and pasting an EQ. I'm really trying to listen to that, make it fit. So with, if I bring back the low end, So you can barely hear some of the low end and some of the top end I'm taking out, but once again, here is just one of the plethoras of little things Dennis had put in. We've gone through drums, multiple bass tracks. We have three synth tracks. Some of them are doing the melody. Some of them are doing a little spooky, even like a, you don't want to say like a Dr. Dre song. They'd have that little spooky synth flowing around in there. That's what he's using here. Now we're getting into the guitars. About the middle of the song, the guitars kick in. So as the song builds, we have that intruder kind of sound that I mentioned from Peter Gabriel. The drums are in, they're gated, they're recorded like Ringo Starr, but this isn't a Beatles retro track. The synths all coming in, you got moves, you got bass sounds, you got the wall sound, and the track's really building, it's sounding so good. But you gotta make sure that when these guitars come in, they really have to explode. So if I put everything on 10, there's no, you can't go to 11. So as you're building these ones with the frequencies, I had to really make sure that um, these guitars are going to fit. So uh, this is Dennis and possibly Kevin. <laughs>
So those are ripping. Uh, that's a 57 on a Little Music Man amp, and it just smokes. I'll let you hear uh, with the plugins off, and then I'll explain what I put on them. Both guitars probably have the same kind of style. That's a Kramer EQ, which I really love. Always put on guitar. Now, on this Neva I'm using, I'm basically boosting at 60. I mean, I really cranked up the low end on this one, but I want the guitars initially were a little bit thinner. And um, I added some mid range and I cut a little bit of top. I did that on both of them. So, once again, both of them in with all the whistles and bells. Those, once again, have to jump out in the track. Now, this one is like a little guitar part that Dennis had written within that section. And that part, we played it. Initially, it was single notes, but I had him do it like a guitar chord, almost like a piano or a Japanese song. So he had to hold the widespread, and then we played it. So each note would, uh, so we did a lot of stuff like that. So, and then we also added Nashville guitars. These are the Nashvilles with it. Play one more time. Now you're gonna hear reverb and we printed it with that. That's not a plug-in. I don't know if you can see this right here, but this is a Fostex reverb unit called a Model 3180. It's not active right now. I'm not using it because it was already mixed a long time ago, but I did commit to printing with this. So our Nashville's ran into this, and that is the spooky sound of that riff now accompanying the other riffs right here. So all together, this is everything. And now we add the wall of sound. So that's kind of how we're building the guitars. Now these are two overdub sections that I'll just go through. I played some guitar on this, and some of it may be my Chavez Ravine guitar, which is this down tuned guitar in a micro sense. I think this is what we're playing here. So those are kind of under these guitars. Now in the layout of the song, this is only gonna happen once and he just wanted that reinforcement. So then I have a guitar towards the end of the song. I think it's gonna be kind of the same vibe. Oh, this is gonna be an, uh, it's an automated section.
So those are two, this is an ending section that was kind of this epic moment at the end of the song, which I'll, I'll be able to play it for you all together. But that was kind of the last of the guitars. There's a little slide guitar that's happening in one of the melodies. All right, so now we're building it. We're getting close to the end of the song. Um, I'm going to rock this song for you. It's a really epic song. So what you hear in the beginning to the end may not make any sense to you, but as I put it all together and I do a playback, uh, you'll be able to enjoy the whole track and how everything comes in. So now that we've done that, one of the last things that we did, uh, I wanted to put some Leslie's on his vocals, a real Leslie. So I'll, I'll have uh, show you a picture of it, what it looks like as a speaker. Some older Leslie's, the speaker moved around. So we have a microphone, the speaker is totally coming by the microphone. Every It's a speed control, so you can make it faster, slower. This particular Leslie was the model used on Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden. And this one has an enclosure that has an opening. So the speaker's not moving, and the enclosure spins around it with an opening. And that's the da, 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 and that gives the Leslie effect. So it's a real speaker. So what I did is I ran his vocals into a reamp, and that just has your XLR comes in, uh, gives you a trim control, and you can make it, since it's going into an amp, you don't want to blast it, so it has a line level. And I basically um, ran the vocals, and this is the Leslie. Now at the end of the song, there's a little tag. So that's the end of the song. So what you're really hearing there, that little kind of sound, it's actually mechanical. There's a motor in there spinning it, so you hear this. I mean, it sounds beautiful to me, and when you put it in with the track, like I said, it's just so smoking. So now we've added the Leslie's on the backup melody. We've got all this other stuff going on. Now it came to the main vocals. The main vocals was, was really a challenge to mix this one, not trying to say, like, you know, I'm so good at what I'm doing. I'm just saying it was really a, a challenge because there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen vocals going on, including the Leslie's. And and Dennis, when he wrote this song, it was very particular. You have a main vocal, then you got a double, then you have these words coming in that are talking back to other lines in the song. So the main vocal. I'm holding my breath. You can take it, but you don't need it. I'm pressing my luck, you can have it, 
I don't need it. So that is about three or four vocals. Then he starts, as the song goes on, the more vocals come in. The time, location, now it's just the difference between the hammer and the nail. I'm not dead. I'm not dead. You told me to call when I make it home safe. If I make it home safe. I've no home. I've no home. Just this place that I go Sometimes I'm lucky and I feel safe I'm lucky if I feel safe Lucky if I feel safe I'm lucky if I feel safe So that gives you an idea of how killer I mean he really put it together well So then as they start to build up Here's another section I don't need it But now your heart is beating fast As you're counting your blessings The city echoes with the blast Keeps everyone guessing. Then as it gets to the end of the song, almost, I mean, you're thrown in the kitchen sink at this point. I'm not dead. You told me to call when I make it home safe. I've no home. Just this place that I go. Sometimes I'm lucky and I feel safe. I'm lucky if I feel Well, I love that. And what a job on Dennis as a songwriter working on this and really putting so much thought into everything. I mean, really, he kind of gave me the ingredients and like, hey, this is what we're going to use to bake this song. And I just got all the pieces and put them together and regurgitated them out into this mayhem. The interesting thing about when you're working with all these vocals was to make them fit. And as you tell right now on the panning, only a few are really panned hard and left. A lot of them are coming up at 9, 10, center. Basically, that's pretty much how they're encompassing the song. What I have on them, there's nothing, nothing that special. There was an EQ. He sang out of an SM7. So I have a little bit of a luxury of being able to cut some of the low ends. So I'll play his main vocal. I'm holding my breath. You can take it. But you don't need it. Now if I take the EQ off. I'm holding my breath. You can take it. But you don't need it. When you talk about music that has to cut through all that, all that sound, I always find myself, it's easy for me. I just get an API and I crank up the high end and I cut the lows. All these vocals have almost all the lows cut out of it. And I think something that's in my ears when I hear songs that have big, boomy, bassy vocals doesn't really do it for me. When you have loud music and you've got to cut through, luckily enough, you have a great singer, great mic, good preamp, you can get away with adding enough top end that isn't crazy. I have a delay on it as well. I'm holding my breath. Without it. You can take it, but you don't need it. And one reason it jumps out is because I'm actually doing that illegal thing I was talking about because you can't go at 11, but I'm cheating. On all these delays, there was an output that I crank. I just love the way it sounds going into the plugins. I turn the analog off. I put barely on slapback. Maybe it's 10%, 15%. So without the slapback, I'm holding my breath. In. You can take it, but you don't need it. So to me, that's beautiful. I love that. 
Then I have an old school wave uh, vocal. I'll do that without it. I'm holding my breath. You can take it, but you don't need it. I have a de-esser. I'm holding my breath. You can take it, but you don't need it. Then a vocal writer, which is basically, uh, this one I'm cranking because it's the lead vocal. I've done all these things of raising and lowering and raising and compression. Then I kind of slam it into a vocal writer, which then gives me the power of when I'm doing the mix. And like I said, everything is just blasting. And if you feel like the vocals aren't loud enough, I can get away with just moving one of the stages, which is the last one for the vocal writer. And it really gives me that freedom of getting all these sounds together. I don't have to adjust any of the gain stages except for the last one in the vocal rider, making it loud enough to sit above the mix. So now that we put all these, you know, the whistles and bells on this track, we're just going to listen back to everything kind of put together. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this is a really fun and challenging session to do. And I feel honored that I'm able to spend my life working with really cool bands like Spirit in the Room. Hopefully you found something in this that you'll enjoy and you can take what I've done and make it even better. I'm not saying that I'm the best in the world at anything that's here, but if you can take being creative, making sure that this, the, the most interesting things can really stand out in the mix, and then walking that fine line of making the artist happy and then making yourself happy, that is the ultimate. This track really made me happy, and that's why I'm sharing it with you, thanks to Produce Like a Pro.
if I feel so 